okay to set the nod from the boss so we can get started. Um, I'd like to welcome you all here this afternoon and also to those who will be watching this on YouTube because all our talks have been on YouTube for the last five years now. Uh, there's quite a collection of them there. If you have an opportunity to get in there, we had uh, other speakers as well as myself and a, a wide range of topics. So um, if you want to get a good dose of apologetics, uh, you know where to go. Um, anyway, I enjoyed last week because uh, we had a talk about mathematics, and of course that's, that's sort of my subject, although statistics is more my thing. Um, and I really enjoyed that because it reminded us how much, how fundamental mathematics is to our understanding of the universe and to all of the physics and everything else like that. And the question is, why can we understand it? That's a good question. And it talks about the design, God having a design and how he's doing it through mathematics. So I sometimes think that God is a mathematician. Uh, I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, some people don't find mathematics all that exciting. In fact, they find it a bit of a pain. And I remember in our first year statistics class, we used to introduce the class to the department and we put up these overhead slides, or they were overhead slides in those days, rather than PowerPoint. And the first one we put up was Department of Sadistics. <laughs> and we had the things that we taught underneath were thumbscrew and, and uh, a rack and, and various other things like that. Um, so, uh, and, and then, then a couple of slides later, it said, now if you want to um, complain about something in the department, you're very welcome to see the head of department. So we put up a Roman centurion. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, talk, talking about suffering, I think that this is our subject today. Um, we, I think we can all manage s some small stuff. Um, I had some this week, as you can probably see by my face. Um, I had a, a, a tooth with a wayward root taken out and an implant put in last Monday. And because I, I have a bit of warfarin, it's blood thinner in my system, uh, I've got, it looks worse than it really is. Uh, when people ask me what's happening, I say, well, you should see the other guy. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, one of the common reactions to this whole question of problem and evil suffering is not so much the small things, but it's the big things that really worry us. And we ask the question, if God created the world, why couldn't have God created a world without suffering and evil? How can God be a God of love and allow these things? It's not just the existence of suffering that causes problems, it's the amount of it, and often it's unfair distribution. You know, why, and that raises the question, which is up here, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do children have to suffer? It seems that God allows unnecessary or excessive evil or suffering at times, and sometimes the suffering seems so pointless. What else I find interesting is that God even encourages questions about suffering. You find right through the Psalms, a large part of the Psalms, the entire book of Job, God's okay with us questioning about suffering. He's, he's happy with it. Um, so in, endeavouring to answer our question, there are two aspects about suffering and evil, which is kind of a side effect as well. Firstly, there's a sort of logical and philosophical approach where we can put things out there and we can argue and we can set up philosophical arguments and some of these are quite convincing, um, but it's, that's only part of it. Unfortunately, cold logic isn't going to help us when we're actually suffering ourselves. So there's, there's a second approach, which is a personal approach, where we endeavour to cope with suffering and evil in our own lives. For example, I've had three Christian friends about my age, I'm 80, and they, they died this last year. And I asked myself, you know, they were good men, why did it happen to them and not to me? And that was a question that, that I really found very hard. And they're all good men. Um, eight years ago, I had a, a superbug. I nearly died. I was close to dying. And that was eight years ago. And it almost took me out. And I often ask myself, you know, why, why, did, I, why did this happen to me? Um, well, I, I come up with an answer. I'm safe to serve. OK, there's a positive side of it. it, it that makes some sense. Um, then my first wife died at 46 after a six-year battle with cancer. That doesn't make sense for her or for me. You know, why did that happen? My answer, I guess, would be, well, she's a Christian, so she's now with God, which is a better place. Um, I was also born with a rare genetic 
gene, which gives me arthritis, that's why I'm stooped. And I ask myself, you know, why do I have that? Well, maybe it's like God's thorn in the flesh has given it to me to be, to be humbled and reliant on God. So we, we find these things come up, we, we come up with some answers, but there's still a very big question of why does God allow these things to happen? Um, what I want to look at now is, um, is, is first of all to look at the philosophical aspects, which in, in some ways are easier because we can sort of put it out there. And often when I'm counselling, one of the things to do <laughs> is to take something that's internal and make it external so I can look at it in a, in a sort of separate way. <clears throat> and this, this question is, which has been bothering um, philosophers down through the centuries, it, it kind of... This, People's thinking about this kind of summed up by Stephen Fry's comment on IQ, uh, or Q and I, sorry, when he was asked what he, would he say when he met God. Why isn't this working? Oh, yeah, it's waking up. Okay. Why isn't it working though? No, it's a bit slow, is it? Okay, there it is. And that's moved on too far. Oh, no, no, wait. You're not, you're not on the screen. There we are. Hang on. There. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> this is what Stephen Fry said when he's going to speak to God. He said, How dare you create a world in which there is such misery that is not our fault? It's not right. Why should I respect a capricious, mean minded, stupid God who creates a world? which is so full of injustice and pain. And now a lot of people think like this. Um, this is a purely emotional response. It's not a logical one, but it's probably aimed at provoking an emotional response. And it raises two questions. First of all, how does Fry come up with the idea that something is unjust? Okay. And from a logical point of view, where do the ideas of right and wrong, good and bad come from? So he's making some sort of assumption there when he says that. Um, what criteria are used and where do the criteria come from to deciding what is uh, mean-minded and what's um, you know, in, unjust? Now, of course, Fry doesn't offer a solution to the problem. He just has a fire at it. And, of course, um, when you abolish God, you not abolish the problem of pain and evil. It's still there. Okay? He hasn't answered anything. He's just had a go. And I guess what Fry is really saying is there's no solution, so just get on with it. So with atheism, there is no solution to the problem of suffering. The answer is just get on with it, you know, put up with it. And atheism, provi atheism provides no consolation, only extinction. And if you take God out of the equation, you still have suffering, pain and meaningless. And I believe that, that suffering <clears throat> makes less sense to an atheist than to a theist, as we'll see when we, we, we talk further on. Now, there are, there are two facts um, which I think are interesting. Uh, this I find very interesting. It's in countries that have endured severe hardship where Christianity has grown the fastest. Why? Okay, um, that doesn't fit into the logical thing at all, does it? It's illogical. And then C.S. Lewis once said, if the universe is so bad, or even half so bad, how on earth did humans ever come to attribute it to the activity of a wise and good creator? So this raises the question of the origin of, um, of universe. And particularly, we see the visible universe as a cold and hostile place, where it's the survival of the fittest, we are told. So there's clearly an overriding personal factor here. Anyway, getting back to the logic, this is how the problem could be spelled out philosophically. If God is all good, God would destroy evil. If God is omnipotent, God could destroy evil, but evil is not destroyed, hence there's no such God. So that's an argument that's often put there. And one variation is if God created the world, why couldn't have God created a world without suffering or evil? Or if God is omnipotent, why didn't he make the best possible world one free of evil and suffering? So that's the problem. <clears throat> so two comments I want to make. First of all, 
being omnipotent, that means all-powerful, does not mean that God can do everything. For example, God cannot make a square circle or make an object so big he can't lift it. God cannot do things which are inconsistent or self-contradictory. And if God is a holy God, God cannot sin. And Aquinas, uh, who is a famous philosopher, comments, if it is more appropriate to say such things cannot be done, then God cannot do them. So that's, we've got to be clarify what we mean by being all powerful. And the second point is what we mean by the best possible world. And the question is best for whom? As we all have different views on this. How would God actually create the best possible world? If God created any world, wouldn't he be able to improve on it? It's logical. If God can do anything and he creates a world, then he must be able to do a better job. Uh, it, 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 is it logically possible for God to create the best possible world? How do we know it was the best? We are then back to the argument that God cannot do something that's inconsistent. For me, the problem is similar to how do you compare two great pieces of music? You know, which is better? We don't have the best possible world at present. For example, it depends on us to be better. So how can it be the best possible world? But one day it will be better. And the Christian has promised there will be a new world without evil, pain, tears or death. And I'll come back to it later. So an alternative argument might be if God is all good, he would destroy evil. If God was omnipotent, he could destroy evil. But evil is not destroyed for, hence God will one day destroy evil. Okay, that's a different answer to the previous question of, of how... And now, now the thing I want to talk about is, if we talked about ha bad things happening to good people, why do good things happen to bad people? Um, this is an interesting question that the psalmist in Psalm 73, he was complaining to God. He said, you know, why do evil people do so well? Why do they prosper, you know? And, 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 and you know, he struggled with this. He, he, and in the end, he went into the sanctuary of God, into the temple, into God's presence. And there he realized that such people were on a slippery slope and their end was destruction. Anyway, the thing is, and we'll move on to this soon, evil can't be destroyed at present without destroying free choice, as we'll see later. However, evil could be eventually destroyed if we go beyond the, go the grave. Now, if you don't believe in an afterlife, then of course that's it. When you die, there's no more. Um, so if there's no afterlife, there's no ultimate justice. So those two go together, I believe. Um, and some further comments, uh, which I'd like to make. The sceptic in saying that evil exists must also accept that good exists. Because he's evoking some sort of standard. And the question is, where does the standard come from? And Augustine argued that if there is a God, why is there so much evil? But if there is no God, why is there so much good? So I'm in the way, am I? I'll, I'll stand over this way a bit. Um, In, in addition to the uh, existence of uh, uh, about about the existence of good, there's also the existence of altruism. That's wanting to do the best for other people when you have no particular reason for doing it. Um, you know why should we? Some people choose their, you give their lives to other people. Why should they do that? Where does altruism come from? And without God in the equation, we find that the existence of human altruism is a major problem. And, and according to a philosopher, Hume, he said you can't derive an ought, which is something we need to do, from an is, something that simply exists. And of course, if evolution is the survival of the fittest, why help weaker people? Why should we bother? Um, survival of the fittest, let's get on with it and tread on anybody who gets in the way. If you believe in karma, why help someone who you think is working out the effects of bad karma? Because if you help them, you make the situation worse because they still have to work out their bad karma. So you're not going to make things any better. And this can lead to fatalism. Whatever will be, will be. So, why suffering? Now, of course, in some sense, suffering can be the product of a good process. You know, rain and hot air, which you're experiencing this afternoon, and cold air 
are necessary for food and life, but another byproduct is a tornado. Um, again, it's good to have food to eat, but you can also get food poisoning. Uh, God can also use bad things to bring out good things. I, I like the story of Joseph um, in Genesis, the first book of the Bible. Joseph had a hard time trying to serve God, and he spent two years unjustly in prison. And Joseph must have thought that God had forgotten about him. However, God was working out his purposes, and Joseph's time came. And because Joseph was able to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh and warn of impending famine, he rose to be second in command at Egypt at the age of 30. How's that for promotion? Um, the punchline comes in the last chapter uh, of Genesis, chapter 50, verse 20, when his brothers find out what Joseph had become. And Joseph said to his brothers, although they meant evil against him, God had other plans and meant it for good. So we see in Joseph's life a kind of tortuous experience. And yet in the end, he was, became second in command at 30. And through him, his, own, his brothers and the ancestors of the 12 tribes of Israel were saved and preserved. So he had also a bigger picture to fulfill. But unfortunately, he had to suffer for it. And here we think God allowed a smaller evil to take place to prevent a much bigger evil. However, we still have this problem of why does it seem to be unnecessary suffering, which seems to happen everywhere, and we're seeing so much of it at the moment. And, and, and logically, it's impossible to know what is unnecessary as we are not God. And in a sense, that's a logical answer to suffering. In other words, God has a reason for it, we don't understand it. Now, that, that's, that's fine logically, and we accept that. But when it comes to emotionally, um, that's not so easy. Uh, and, and I'm going to talk about natural disasters a little bit later on. Um, what I want to do is a sort of preamble, is to look at some traditional religious responses to the problem. For the materialist, for example, um, there's no explanation, only bad luck. For a religious person, there are perhaps some of the following suggestions we will look at. First of all, suffering is God's judgment, and God judges nations. And at one stage, he, he judged Israel because Israel was spiritually bankrupt. And we see the story of this in Amos, where the poor were oppressed and the religion was corrupt. And Amos is just a, just a shepherd, simple shepherd, was called by God to warn them of judgment. And God had a special covenant relationship with Israel, whereby they were rewarded if they did what God told them and were punished when they were, not, when they were disobedient. And the interesting thing about it, I, I find intriguing, and we find it quite a bit in the Psalms, the verse which says that God is long-suffering. You'll see it occur again and again in the Old Testament, that God is patient and long-suffering, long not wishing that any should perish. Anyway, um, judgment can occur, all right? And that's not the whole story, but it's one story. The second one is the Jews believe that suffering is God's judgment on personal or parent sin. Um, in other words, if you are suffering, then either you or your parents must have sinned. Now, my response to this is, 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 is several different ways. So first of all, that the consequences of sin can lead to consequences which are, involve personal suffering. If we abuse our bodies, we get sick. So there's a kind of a natural aspect there as well. But here we're talking about God's judgment on sin. This is very, very different. And of course, the sins of our parents can affect us physically and psychologically in different ways. And we see this the same cause and effect. Um, and, and I'm sort of been, as a counsellor, I'm involved sometimes a lot with what happens to people in the past. I invariably find that things that are happening now have begun somewhere further back, um, often at a parental stage or some early stage in their life. Um, you see, you might have a father who's an alcoholic and a wife beater. And the last thing the son wants is to grow up like his father. So his attention is focused on the behaviour of his father rather than on positive behaviour. And as you tend to become what you're focused on, the son then turns out to follow the same path with the same repercussions. And we've actually seen this in the odd TV programme. We've got the, the sort of father beating up the son and then the son beats up his son. You know, it's kind of a similar pathway. So we can, we can hurt our children by giving them our hang-ups. Now, the interesting thing is that Jesus didn't agree with this Jewish approach, that, that, that suffering is caused by your personal sin or your parents' sin. 
And he, 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 he just inferred that it happens without actually giving specific reasons. And he refused to accept the popular Jewish idea at the time that disasters and calamities are God's punishment for sin. In fact, um, there's an interesting couple of verses in Luke which says, following, it talks about two accidents, that, well, two things that happened. The first one, there was a kind of uprising of Galileans. So they were kind of a, a, a Jewish group um, under probably a particular leader. And because of their uprising, Pilate had them had them martyred while they were in the, involved with their with their sacrifices during their their worship. Um, it's the verse says now there were some present at the time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. So it was during a time of of worship that that they were martyred, and Jesus said, "Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way?" I tell you no. But unless you repent, you too will reperish. So he's not saying that, that they're any different. The important thing is to learn from it. We need to re repent of where we are. Um, and then he goes on to tell another story of those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think they're more guilty than any others living in Jerusalem? Now, we've heard about buildings falling over uh, and, and who's responsible well, it's not the punishment by God, what, um, what Jesus is saying. He says, they're no more guilty than any others living in Jerusalem. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will perish. In other words, these accidents were designed to, to help us to remember that we need to be right with God. Because we don't know how long we're going to be on this planet. Um, so, okay, get right with God, <laughs> just in case something happens to us. And so, so th these two things were probably going around the local watering hole, you know. Um, one was a state-sanctioned terror, and the other one was a random accident. And both saw people snuffed out with little warning, for no clearly apparent reason. And I said, both kinds of events lead us to realise how precarious our existence is. And Jesus implied the victims did nothing wrong, nothing that caused their demise. But the listeners should take the events as a warning to get right with God. And there's one other example in John chapter 9 where there was a man blind from birth and the disciples said to him, you know, why is this man blind from birth? It's because he sinned or his parents. And Jesus said, neither. It's so that the glory of God will be shown, which it was because he healed the man. Um, okay, so what, what Jesus is really saying is that no one is completely guiltless. Okay. When we say, um, why do bad things happen to good people, a response might be, there are no good people. But that's, that's not really a good answer. <laughs> but it's, it's one of those slick answers that you can wave around. Um, so all are sinful and we should take tragedies as warning. We should repent and be prepared to meet God at any time. Now another one is that Satan can afflict people. Um, now because you don't believe in Satan, then of course um, it's, not a, it's not a problem. Uh, but then we find that, you know, in the Bible, and of course I'm speaking now to people who are on YouTube as well, um, you know, we read in the Bible that there's some supernatural beings God created, and they rebelled against God. And since then, they've interfered with us in the world. And we see this in the first few chapters of Genesis, where we see the effects of disobedience to God. And Adam and Eve found themselves excluded from the garden to a very different world, a fallen world, where there was toil and hardship. And we find that God does allow Satan to afflict people as a test. We see in the story of Job, um, and this is a very famous story, and what it does is it shows Job suffering, unbelievable suffering, losing practically everything, almost his life as well, family, um, possessions, uh, even his wife and his own health. And yet he continued to believe God and we see the story, it's sort of set as God allowing Satan to test him. Um, and all the time, Job's comforters, you've probably heard of that phrase, the three of them came and they said, you know, the trouble with you, Job, is you've been sinful and you should repent. And Job said, no, I'm, I haven't. It's not this at all. I don't understand why this happened to me. And he complained and he complained and he complained to God. Did God, did God answer his question? No, God didn't. But what he did in the end was he pointed out that I am God and therefore 
are you God? Do you know, can you do the things that I do? And God basically said, well, look, you know, um, I, I am the creator of this world and what I do is what I do and I can't explain it to you. He left it unanswered. Question. But then he, he honoured Job when he said that, that he honoured him above the three friends and he said, Job, you, you can pray for them. And then, he, and then we find the story that God restored everything back to him. Now, whether the story is true or not, some people would debate that. Job is mentioned somewhere else in the Bible, in the Old Testament. But whatever way you see that story, it's very interesting because it runs contrary to the Jewish view of sin and suffering. Completely contrary. And doesn't provide the answer except that God is God. Um, so th that I find is a fascinating story. And we find that there are several places where we're told that Satan bound somebody. For example, um, in Luke 16, verse 13, Jesus speaks about the daughter of Abraham being bound by Satan for 18 years. He has the phrase he used. And so somehow or other people can have an effect by tempting people to sin. And there was this paralyzed man, um, John 15, 5, 14, he was healed at the pool of Bethesda. And, and Jesus told him, not just healed him, but said, go and sin no more. So there's obviously a connection. Uh, um, and he said to him, so nothing worse would befall him. And then we told the woman caught in adultery, much the same thing. And um, basically Jesus said the same thing to her. And then we got the man who let down the um, four friends who left down this guy. They cut a hole in the roof. <laughs> Bet they were popular. Um, and laid down this guy at, at Jesus' feet. And what did Jesus do? Did he heal him? No, he, he said he forgave his sins. So there is a connection, you know, between, um, if you like, Satan, I suppose. Uh, he can inflict people indirectly through our sin. Um, one very popular uh, uh, answer to this is reincarnation. Uh, reincarnation is, you know, we keep coming back and... and uh, you know, if you, if you really sin badly, you might come back something really nasty like a mathematician. Um, uh, but, you know, there is a cycle. And, and this is very popular with, with Eastern religions. Um, and and what, it, what it says basically is that um, rewards and punishments are determined by the way we live in previous existences. Um, it's quite an attractive belief because it, it sort of reconciles the suffering in the world with the justice of God. Suffering is the outworking of bad karma, whatever that is. And I find reincarnation has a lot of problems. Um, for example, why aren't we getting better? Why isn't society improving? You know, if we're, we're going to be punished and come back something nasty, why aren't we better the next time round? We're not, are we? Um, and then how can the suffering benefit us if we don't know where it comes from? You know, if you suffer from something in a past <coughs> life, you know nothing about it. How is it going to help you? Um, then you've got the question of when did it first start? There are inequalities to start with. Where did they come from? Uh, so there's, there's, there's a whole range of, of problems. And, and in, in these sort of pantheistic systems, there's no moral standard for right and wrong. Karma is not a moral law. It's just a system of retribution with no fundamental guidelines to tell us what to do. Sin must be punished and cannot be given. And this is contrary, of course, to Christian grace, God's unmerited favour. And, of course, reincarnation offers no help for the sufferer. Back to the same position of the atheist, well, tough, you know. You've got to work it out and, you know, if you do a good job this time, you might do better next time. You might come back as a carpenter or something more interesting than a mathematician. Um, so it's not much comfort to you told if you try hard, things will be better the next time around. And one of the problems with the doctrine of reincarnation that leads to fatalism, <clears throat> and it par <coughs> paralyzes the desire to improve society and our environment. Why bother to help people? It's their own fault. So in a way, reincarnation is anti-humanitarian, is that if you help somebody, they'll have to suffer even more to work off their debt to karma. And interesting enough, um, uh, there was one p person, I'm just trying to think, I've got a quote here and I can't see, oh yes, from a guy called Norman Geisley, he says, 
The social compassion that exists in India is a result of non-Hindu, largely Christian influence. Hinduism did not produce Mother Teresa. Now, it's probably a little unfair um, as Indians, but it, it, it does reflect on this whole question um, of reincarnation. Now, of course, the second, number four here, suffering is all in the mind. Um, one approach is to deny its existence, and if we're positive enough, we'll be healed. Um, there are several religious groups that teach this, for example, Christian science. Um, and there's some truth in what they say, of course. Um, if we're positive in our thinking, then we'll have better health. And, and, and we see this with the concept of a placebo. You know, if we believe that, that this thing we have in front of us, which is only a sugar pill, which is the one we've been given, not the, not the real deal, if we believe in it, we'll get an improvement. And, and these have been some of the problems in statistical studies in the past. Um, I'm trying to remember some of them, but I've forgotten all that stuff now. Um, but there were some major ones done on... on um, uh, yeah, anyway, they got it all wrong because it didn't allow for the placebo effect. So that's what happens, you have to give somebody something and they'll think it helped, it works. And then you give something to something would they think it works and it also does work, so you get a difference. So you can say, okay, it's the actual <coughs> pill itself that's working, not the placebo. So the placebo effect is very, very strong. Um, so there is a sense in which suffering is all in the mind. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't really answer any questions when <laughs> we are suffering. Um, yeah, uh, Christian science, I feel, sometimes is not too Christian and not very scientific, but that's probably a bit unfair. Um, there's science and health. Uh, I, I know my father used to, he, he studied a lot of these things, and one of them he used to read was the Science and Health by Mary, Mary Baker Eddy, I think. And he found it had some good things in it, which probably has. Um, so anyway, suffering is not all in the mind. Uh, if I sit on a, pil on a pin, then I know it's, uh, it's more than just the mind. Um, it's the other end. Uh, <laughs> okay, we come now to the free will defence, which is basically the, the sort of traditional approach um, that people have today in trying to deal with this question of suffering. And the, the big question is, do we have free will? And of course, there are some people who believe we don't. Um, you know, th there's a lot of philosophical debate, and I've read a lot of it, and all I can say is, oh, <laughs> it's all too much. Um, but there are some that believe that, that, that we are, um, we don't have any free will, that we are determined. And again, there's an element of truth in that. Um, you see, we don't have as much freedom as we think we have. The type of person we are depends not only on our physical and genetic makeup, but also our environment and the decisions we make. And, and, I, and I think, you know, that if I had a certain decision to make, my wife would probably have a good idea how I'd make it. Okay, because she knows me. And so she would, she would sort of say, well, look, you know, this is, this is how you usually do this. Um, so there is a sense in which there's a certain amount of deterministic element. So we don't, we're not completely as free as we think we are. But we certainly do have freedom. Um, and we do have options. Sometimes they're limited, but we do have options. And so we're free to do things that are bad for our minds and our bodies. And these have physical and mental consequences. And as a counsellor, I'm very aware about faulty thinking and how huge effect it has on our physical and mental health. I find out burnout, depression is quite common these days. I find a lot of depression. Burnout is quite common with people who, who have very, very full lives. Um, so anyway, we are, we are free to hurt ourselves in lots of ways. If we abuse our bodies, then we get sick. And so it's pretty obvious. And we're also free to hurt others. Um, and we can do this in lots of ways. Often it's just by sheer neglect. Instead of speaking up what we should do, we, we actually don't. And of course, sometimes it can happen from shoddy workmanship, such as buildings falling down in earthquakes. And, for example, mines not being adequately have security, safety security. So there are often things which are caused by other people. Um, and, of course, this sort of carelessness can lead to pollution. These days we're facing the plastic bag problem. Um, and we can, we can cause this. this is, in, in a way, this is we're hurting others when we, when we allow this sort of thing to happen. And we get pollution in our water and on land and in the air. 
Um, there's also spiritual pollution because we're bombarded, bombarded by advertising. And the idea of the media is to make us dissatisfied with how we look, with what we own, with where we live, and so on. So that there is also um, this, this hurt, if you like, comes from our media, which we're bombarded with. <clears throat> and there's, there's one area which I find fascinating. And this is in Exodus 34, verse 7, which says, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Now these two sentences seem to be contradictory. We've got on the one hand God being long-suffering, yet he's allowing sin being passed on to the third and fourth generation. Now how does this happen? Um, well, the answer is the consequences of sin. But th there is another principle operating here. Um, the first stage, as I said, was sin, and we saw this with, the, with King David. King David um, saw Bathsheba on a rooftop and ended up marrying her and sending Uriah, her husband, off to the front line to get killed. Um, and so there was judgment. The baby was, got sick, the baby that followed, and, and then when the baby died, Nathan the prophet said to the king, "'Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house.'" Because you despise me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your Hittite to be your own. In other words, there are consequences when we do things like that. Um, there is another aspect which which I think is really intriguing. This is the subject of epigenetics. How many people know about epigenetics? Okay, epigenetics is a new subject. Epi means bigger than genetics, and what it says is that we have. Although we have genes which help us to make protein, form our bodies, we have genes which can switch on and off. And these genes can be switched on and off by behaviour and environment. In other words, we're getting back to the old idea put forward by a guy called Lamarck, which says that um, years and years ago, and became poo-poo, that in actual fact our environment can cause our gene change. And that was rubbished. Now we find we've got these switches, we can switch them on and off. And so therefore, if we do something which is, which is abusive to ourselves or wrong, it can switch on a switch and we may get cancer because it's already there. So we have a, a, a source here which is much, much deeper. And what's more surprising is that these switches can be inherited. So what you collect during your lifetime, you can pass on to your children. Now that changes the whole picture of third and fourth generation, doesn't it? Because it means that certain things can be passed on. And it's the first time I really understood that verse. I used to understand it in terms of if somebody is, um, is, is, denies God, then that's going to have an effect. But I can see now that it can also have a genetic effect. Okay, so we see this, this principle of epigenetics operating. Suffering is all in the mind, the free will defence. We are free to help... Uh, to hurt our, ourselves, we're free to help others, and, free, and, 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 and of course we can do it long term through epigenetics. Free will exists in the spiritual realm. Now, of course, the Bible speaks about spiritual beings called angels for the world was created, and they chose to rebel against God. Now, of course, those of you listening may not believe that, but there is a battle on, and at times we get caught in the crossfire. This is what happened to Job. Um, and Job was kind of the centre of a spiritual battle, I suppose, or debate between God and Satan. I don't have time to enlarge on this. But anyway, it exists there. And then finally, we are free to ignore God. We are free to ignore God. And when we do this, I believe we hurt ourselves the most. You know, at the very depths of our being, uh, once we ignore what I believe we were created for, to know God, then we are really hurting ourselves the most. I believe that our destiny is to worship God. Our destiny is not to be happy. I don't think happiness is, is a central thing. It's to serve God. And when we serve God, it does bring its own joy. And I was saying to someone today, in the New Testament, there are three places where it involves service. And then after that, it says, enter into the joy of the Lord. Because the joy comes from serving God. 
But that's not the main purpose. The main purpose is to serve God and to see that God's will is done. And I believe that's what we're created for. And when we look at the Old Testament prophets, some of the things they went through, I mean, poor old Jeremiah, you know, here he is in a pit, left to die, because he had to give an unpopular message um, to the people, and yet he was saved. And then there was Isaiah, a young man, who God says, I want you to go and speak up. And he says, well, who am I? I can't, I can't sp speak up, you know. And Moses, what did that old Moses? He says, no, I don't want to go off and, and, and do something with the children of Israel. I'm not a good speaker. Get my brother Aaron, you know, he'll, he'll take care of it. Um, we get put in things, things which are not comfortable, tough. The important thing is God's will be done. And then when we do God's will, things can happen. Now, of course, when we have these freedoms, there are some consequences. Free will means we live in a neutral world. Okay, Jesus said, for example, that the, the sunshine and the rain fall on the evil and the good. God sent his rain on the just and the unjust because the world is impartial. If we are to have freedom, freedom of will, it's got to be an impartial will so we can exercise that freedom. And secondly, the world has to be a consistent place with the future resembling the past. I mean, I can talk to you because we can set up sound waves in, in this common air between us. Fire always burns, not just bad people. So we can learn to understand it and protect ourselves. A knife doesn't turn into a celery stick when we want to... Um, uh, uh, harm somebody, God doesn't step in and say, right, you can't do that. Every act, he's going to stop you from doing it. The world would be an impossible place if it was inconsistent. And so we've got to have a consistent place in order to exercise our free will. And of course, if God intervened to remove the worst suffering, okay, let's take away something really terrible. Okay, God intervened. Then you'd say, well, what about the next one? Not so, so bad. Um, should he intervene on that one? People say, well, yes. In, in the end up, he intervenes on everything. We have no free will. Okay, so there's a problem here of where you've got a world with free will and a world with natural laws. And often these two are going to conflict. Um, where do you stop? Okay, <sighs> time to do a, a move on. Um, here we are. Free will means a neutral world. The world must be consistent. Um, is, we talked about the best possible world before. Um, and, and of course... The thing is that, that one answer to that question about that possible world is God made everything perfect. One of the perfect things that God made was a world of free creatures. Um, free will can cause evil, hence imperfection, evil, can arise from the perfect. Um, so this still doesn't get around the question of what we mean by a perfect world, because we don't know what that is, because it can't be because we're in it. <laughs> But God allowed the possibility for imperfection by creating us with free will. And I, I remember um, Philip Yancey in his book, Where is God When It Hurts? Um, I've read three of his books. They're excellent books. What's so amazing about grace? And they're, they're such, such good books. So he wrote about the question of the best possible world. And he, he pointed out a comment I've just made that... that in creating a superior world that has both a system of natural laws and free will, both good principles, if you do away with one, you have problems with the other. Uh, so you've got natural law and you've got free will. You're going to have a conflict. And of course, when we come to design something, we often have to compromise. Those of your engineers will know that sometimes it, it, with, with a car, it might be um, weight versus safety. You have to do a compromise, a bit of this and a bit of that. And I suspect that, that the world we have at the moment is, is a kind of a compromise from a designer's point of view. Um, okay. God is going to make creature like us. What is the most perfect way he could do it? Surely he would want to make a creature that freely loved him. He could make us love him, but we would then just be puppets. And surely that is less than perfect. So our answer then is, God make everything perfect. I've already said this, haven't I? Yes, I have. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, I've jumped ahead of myself. Let's move on to number 13. <laughs> We're getting near the end. Um, the world has to be neutral about God. And, and I think this is quite important because if we are to love God freely, the world has to be a neutral place. If it's not a neutral place, then how can we be free to love God? <laughs> 
And, and those that submit themselves to God, they will see signs of a divine presence, while those that don't will only see destruction. In other words, where you come from will determine your perception. I find this a lot in counselling. You get this perception rather than fact that seems to appear a lot. And the philosopher by the name of Heck, he's a well-known philosopher, um, he said, the world would be religiously ambish, ambiguous, both veiling God and revealing him. Revealing him to ensure man's freedom of choice. Uh, sorry, veiling him to ensure man's freedom of choice. So he's veiled, so we have a choice. And revealing him to men as they rightly exercise that freedom. In other words, when we exercise the freedom to serve God, we then see differently. We are, as it were, converted or changed in some way. So summarising, we say that some suffering comes from the interaction of a neutral world with the existence of free will, which can lead to sin against ourselves, against others and against God. Now, in a world, that, that free, in a world with free will that avoided all suffering, then what would happen about moral qualities? You know, if there's no, if, if there's no suffering at all, um, one of the things that I think is so important from suffering is we learn love and compassion. And there are lots of very, very positive things that come out of suffering. And I think, and, and we see this often when there's, when there's a, um, places where there might be a, a, a typhoon or a flood or an earthquake, people come together and they show compassion and help each other. In other words, love can grow through sharing in times of difficulty. So, Getting back to our initial dilemma, remember it says if God is all good, God would destroy evil. If God is omnipotent, God could destroy evil, but evil is not destroyed, hence there is no such God. An answer, if God is all good, he would destroy evil. If God is omnipotent, he could destroy evil, but evil is not destroyed, hence God will one day destroy evil. That's an answer, if you like, to, the, to our dilemma. Um, now I want to finish, so I see I've been gas bagging as usual. Um, I want to finish up with accidents and natural disasters because these are a real problem. Um, and one of the things that, that comes, comes to us when we, when we think about natural disasters is a, 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 what we call the second law of thermodynamics. So how many people have heard about the second law of thermodynamics? It basically, it's basically says that the amount of useful energy in the universe is decreasing. In other words, we're, running, we're winding down. And, and why does it happen? It's because differences tend to even out. If you've got hot and cold and you mix them together, you don't get more hot or more cold. You get a middle temperature. There's an evening out. There's a loss of energy. For example, if we've got a dam and a water up here, it's got potential energy. It's got energy. As it flows through the dam, it becomes kinetic energy. It turns turbines, turbines, and then eventually it runs out, and then it just spreads out, and it loses the capacity for that energy. So we eventually lose the energy as things decrease. And the actual law is actually about statistics. It's about probabilities, called the law of entropy. And what it says is that the amount of randomness is increasing. Uh, my description of it is everything falls to bits sooner or later. For example, you could have um, this pile of beautifully done stack of, say, tins of fruit in a supermarket forming a triangle, right? Now that has, that has low entropy because it's not random, right? Some kid comes along and knocks it over. It all falls on the floor, right? okay? The entropy is increased because it's got more random. Now, if we go away and leave it for 10 years, um, all the tins will start to break down and then leave a, a silly mess. Even more random. So what happens is that the world is tending to be more random and less structured. And so what happens then is that, that we've got this, this process going on of things breaking down. Um, for example, machines break down and there are accidents. On the road, at home, at work, we have them all the time. I've got a couple of appliances that sort of uh, at the moment. Um, we are falling to bits as well, <laughs> I hate to say that, as we are part of the system. Um, because our bodies are alive, we can reverse, partly reverse the trend, but it gets harder as you get older, as I've found. Um, the world is breaking down at a macroscopic level. I'll just make sure, I think of this on the, on the next slide. Accidents and natural, no, I haven't moved on, here it is. 
Our bodies break down. The world is breaking down at what we call a large level. What's happening is that the stresses in the Earth's crust are evening out things, plate tectonics. And so what's happening is that, is that this is caused by, again, a, a random effect, if you like. And so the world is breaking down at the large level. And so if, for example, um, your fence falls over, it's not an act of God, but it's because the fence may be a bit old and it's uh, heading downhill. Um, so the world is breaking down at this macroscopic level, big level. It's also breaking down at the microscopic level. Genes and chromosomes have accidents too. And these accidents are called mutations and they usually occur through environmental changes. And they're usually harmful. And we can pass some of them on to our children. We also carry some potentially lethal genes. Did you know we all have a, a set of genes which, um, which don't affect us because there are not enough of them, but we do tend to carry lethal genes um, because we pick them up as we go along. And um, provided we, we don't get too many or, they, or certain ones get switched on, um, we, we do okay. And because of mutational accidents, an ordinary bug can become a bad bug. Um, eight years ago, I nearly died of a super bug. I think I've always said that, haven't I? Um, you know, and as these things are floating around and why they, why they happen to us, I don't know, but, um, except I can say I'm safe to serve because that was a very close call. Um, and, and of course, strains keep mutating. Bugs keep changing and, and not only do you get the, the original parents, you get their grandfathers and their, their aunts and uncles and, and they're all a bit different. And, and so the common cold is hard to treat because the various strains keep mutating. And so we see in the nature of the world leads to all kinds of suffering, natural disasters, accidents, sickness, and genetic damage. I think the reason why those disasters upset us so much is because, in a way, they're, 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 although they're painful, they tend to be exceptional. The things that happen in our lives are often exceptional. I mean, people wake up most days feeling good, except when I try and get out of bed in the morning. That's my athletic event for the day. Um, <laughs> Uh, or unless you're starving or recovering from an earthquake, there's plenty of that, but most illnesses are treatable. Most planes take off and land without mishap. And the accident, the injury, and the tumour are life-shattering, but they're generally fairly rare. Unfortunately, there's not much comfort if you're going through a rare event. Um, and of course, it does depend on what country you live in. I mean, there are terrible inequalities in the world. Anyway, that's, that's enough about the world, but you can see that there are certain aspects of the world where things happen because of the natural processes of this evening out of the world and the increase of randomness. It's part of our fallen world. I want to finish now with some briefly with some positive aspects of, of suffering, um, which I'll go th fairly through fairly quickly. I think the first thing about, about suffering is that it, we, it has a positive physical role. I mean, if you stick your hand on a hot stove, you know all about it. It's a protective thing. So there is a sense in which we do need to, to have, have pain to protect us from our environment. Um, there's also a link between pain and pleasure. They go in hand in hand. The same nervous system that gives us pain also gives us pleasure. And so life is full of contrast. You can't really know joy, perhaps without knowing pain and suffering. And we had all about joy this morning in church. Um, suffering can wake us up. Um, C.S. Lewis said it's his megaphone to rouse the deaf world. And sometimes we can just box along quite nicely and then boom! And then it makes us stop and think, wow, what's life about? Where am I heading? What am I up to? Um, okay, and then it can be a refining process. Um, it can make us fit people for God's kingdom. John Hick calls it soul making. And the Bible mentions four ideas of this. First of all, it speaks about. Um, in Hebrews, it speaks about the writer of Hebrews saying that, that God sometimes disciplines us as a, as a parent with a child. In other words, we have to teach our child not to put their finger in the light socket unless they want to make the hair stand on end. You know, there are certain things that happen which we have to chastise our children. And in a sense, God does the same thing. And he does it because he loves us. It's very, very clear in Hebrews 12 that that's what God does because he does it because he loves us. Um, and so it can be a disciplinary process. <coughs> Better move on. Um, suffering can develop character. It teaches us perseverance and self-sacrifice. Um, and we can allow our children to stumble and fall, suffer the consequences, because that's how we learn. And, and suffering, in a way, is a learning process. I've had enough of it in my life, and I'm still learning. Um, still have to be woken up every now and again and 
get just shifted out of my complacency. Um, it also removes any sense of um, self-reliance and pride. You see, Paul had this, this um, it's called thorn in the flesh, but in actual fact, it was, it was more like a, a, um, a spike, something really major, not just something small that, that Paul had. And we don't know what it was, whether it was some kind of, um, um, I can't think of the right word, I can't the right words. I find one of the things with the ageing process is when you want a word, you remember it five minutes later when it's too late. Um, but the thorn was something quite drastic. So it was a major thing for, for Paul. And, um, and, and, and he said that it taught him to, to rely on God. Um, so I was there for a purpose. And then the other thing too is that suffering helps provide an internal purpose. Because, you know, we can look ahead and say, well, look, in the end, it doesn't matter what happens to me, I know God is there. God is there, and so therefore I can trust God with the life or death. It does not matter. And to me, that's, that's a huge thing. Um, now our citizenship is in heaven. And Paul says, our present sufferings won't compare with our future glory. And of course, two Sundays ago, we had Mike Hubbard's talked about what heaven is like. Very, very interesting. Um, <coughs> suffering can also be for God's glory. There are times when people are, are dramatically healed. Um, I, I have, I'm on a number of websites which are related to what happens on mission fields. I hear stories all the time of people being healed suddenly, sometimes over time, but, but being healed through the presence of some pastor coming in and praying for them and things happen. So that sometimes suffering can be for God's glory. It also develops a, um, a, an empathy. Um, because one of the things I've found is that because I'm a counsellor, the fact that I have suffered myself, I think makes me a better counsellor. I, I can get alongside better people because I'm better with people because I know a little bit. You can't put yourself in another person's shoes, but you can appreciate to a small extent what they're going through and how hard it really, really is. And so we, it does help us to um, to to um, have empathy with people who suffer. Um, and unmerited suffering particularly <coughs> brings out the best in people. It's because suffering seems so in indiscriminate that it evokes a response. <coughs> and then finally we've got the world is to be restored. Um, and, and Paul talks about this, that we are in bondage to decay with the whole of creation in Romans 8 groaning for that day when things will come right again. Um, and we see the same thing also in, in Revelation. Um, and we're told the New Testament teaches that God's objective is to establish his kingdom on earth with us. There will be a new heaven and a new earth without suffering, death and predation in nature. And it seems that God doesn't waste suffering as it can have a purpose. And um, as I say, when suffering happens to us, instead of asking, why has this happened to me? We can ask, what have I learnt? Instead of asking, what's the meaning for this? We ask, what meaning can I give to this? And how many of you have heard of Viktor Frankl? He's a, a Jewish psychiatrist who was, was in a um, concentration camp, prisoner of war. He made the following insight more full comment. Man is ready and willing to shoulder any suffering as soon and as long as he can see meaning in it. So if we can find meaning in our suffering, then it can transform that suffering within ourselves. And the thing we have to realise is that God understands suffering. You know, he teaches about Jesus, the Son of God, emptying himself, becoming a man for the purpose of dying on the cross. And when he became flesh, he became subject to the forces of nature, hunger, thirst, suffering, fulfilled the role of the suffering servant in Isaiah 53. And when he was crucified, in a mysterious way, God experienced suffering through Jesus. And the death of Jesus is the greatest example of unjustified suffering the suffering of a totally innocent man. He transforms suffering into something wonderful for the benefit of all mankind and becomes part of our redemption and leads to our future resurrection. In the same way, our suffering can be transformed and used for the benefit of all whom we come in contact with. And God doesn't necessarily remove suffering, but gets alongside us and comforts us so we can comfort others. And God's not oblivious to suffering. He's even aware of the sparrow, we're told, in um, um, is it, is it John 6, I've, again, my memory's playing up on me. He's aware of even the sparrow falling to the ground. 
And I, I, what I really like, I finished with this, was St. Paul's conversion. He was on the road. He'd been um, taking people who, who were Christians and persecuting them. And then he met Jesus on the road. And the words of Jesus were, why are you persecuting me? Why did he say that? He wasn't persecuting Jesus. He was persecuting the Christians. And when the Christians were persecuted, they were persecuted Jesus. In other words, he was identifying himself with them. And I think that's a good place to stop. That somehow or other, Jesus in all his, in his humanity is able to understand where we're from. Thank you. Thank you.